crackery folks. <clears throat> Hot tea. You know what that means. How is everyone? Uh, it's Friday night for the stream. Uh, if you're watching this recorded, obviously it could be any night. Who knows? Ooh, hope everyone's good. Uh, it's only two days since the last stream, so this is um, an added one. Uh, with these, I don't always know if I'm going to publish them or not. Beyond the stream, I publish the recordings. All depends, really. Let's see how we get on. These are a bit more free form. Um, I've got some updates and things as well, which are worth putting across. Um, let's see, where are we? Let's just uh, let everyone know we're live. Take some more of my tea. I noticed that ball is twisted around below. Look at that mischievous thing. Oh, wait a minute. The board looks relatively straight compared to the board. Uh, sorry, the um, thing that it's on. Uh, I think in many cases it can be the um, the problem with this camera here is that um, just turn that light down a bit. Is that um, what I really need to do is when I get my printer working again is get the get something printed um, that um, get something printed that holds the camera a bit better at the moment it's got like a sprung clamp um, but it doesn't fit properly and it's really um, Heath Robinson quite frankly and what I really need to do is print out something the right shape to hold the camera so that I can still get to the lens adjustments because they're all manual lenses not motorized I mean, if I was really fancy, of course, not only could I do something that held the um, camera in place, but also move the lens controls. Now, wouldn't that be something? It's quite a lot of work. When I can just go and, you know, do it from here with my fingers. Us. Fairly straightforward. Um, whoever is there now, uh, perhaps you can let me know how the audio is. Make sure my levels are good. Hopefully there isn't any awful background noise. I can just hear my fridge. Ah, oh, Laurie's here. Audio is fine. Thank you, Laurie. Um, what do we want to talk about today and what do we want to deal with? Uh, let's do the update things and um, one of the things I really want to discuss today are modes. Uh, these are important. But first uh, let's just look at the documentation here as I've got it. So um, over there you will notice I now have Chrome browser window working in OBS. I found the magic trick that enables it to show instead of just a black window. Um, so this is the ICE Logic Deck repository. Um, I did some work yesterday. I'm just trying to think. It's only been a day since I streamed on Wednesday. So. Um, one of the things I was working on was 
uh, the docks but in particular I wanted to get this readme sorted out because it was a really simple hold placeholder really um, so um, yeah uh, I've now put something in there that's a bit more um, a bit more appropriate I mean it's not final but it, it, it's kind of a placeholder so we've got something to point to from a kind of sourcing point of view because obviously I want to get ready for people to um, understand what this is so they can start taking part in the development when I get the uh, first batch of boards done um, in February for everyone that wants to partake excuse me oh by the way in other news um, I met my uh, eldest daughter yesterday for coffee after school uh, she's a teacher not a student um, just doing the catch up I quite often do and um, then she called me back in the evening and said oh crap I've got Covid uh, which isn't a surprise you know hundreds of her pupils have got Covid and are off of it probably a large percentage of the uh, teaching faculty etc as well so yeah she's been dodging the bullet for the last few years and uh, it finally caught her but it's very very mild uh, obviously Omnicron um, so that's pretty good so she called me up obviously yesterday evening and said by the way I know we met earlier for a coffee I've got Covid so I'm now kind of in isolation mode I have to be um, the NHS contacted me obviously and um, I've got some tests um, I did a test today and it came out negative uh, so the test isn't picking anything up at the moment there was no sign of it not even a faint reading etc it was a very conclusive new no, which I'm hoping is going to remain a no but you never know these things I don't really have any symptoms or anything yet so um, we will see but just a warning if I don't tip up in a few days time you'll know why <clears throat> but as I say she's had it really mild she's obviously having to isolate until next week before she can go back to school for obvious reasons so uh, sorry back to the ice logic so um, one of the things I did was I took a couple of pictures with a camera uh, it's pretty difficult in the winter I don't have a setup that makes it easier I do need to um, do that normally I do my photography in the summer and then it's easier lighting wise but anyhow this will do for now I mean it doesn't look particularly beautiful because the board itself doesn't look particularly beautiful simply because it was it's been messed about a lot with so um, the first shot is quite nice here so one of the things that I'm trying to do here is show that the ice logic deck the deck idea essentially um, is whereby you have these tiles and then you have the kind of carrier board and when you put you them together you get this kind of arrangement yeah so it's a little story into pictures um, with what I've got uh, yeah and the heading says the deck based solution is formed by combining multiple tiles and the ice logic board carrier and then the next one says together these form an ice logic deck solution again just visually trying to get something across here uh, to show um, what ice logic deck or what logic deck principally um, is about um, then I've got some links to places so I've got like um, uh, I'll come back to the links in a minute as well I've updated the uh, layout and schematics um, these actually aren't the latest I didn't have the latest on this machine that I did it in um, so but it these are a bit bit more um, a bit closer uh, to what we actually produced here in this we're actually slightly newer than that because if you look carefully you'll notice there's no hyper RAM here um, 
on because that comes on a mezzanine. So this this was done afterwards. I couldn't find the original version of the one that goes with this because I mean I could have done perhaps, um, but it, again I had to go with what was on this machine at the time. So I was a bit stumped. Um, so that's there as well now, which is kind of cool. So it looks a bit better, a bit nicer, perhaps. Um, the listing here, so hardware sources just takes you to where the source files are, because this is obviously open source. Um, and I want people to be able to go in there and, you know, have a look at the files and stuff. Firmware sources, well, if you look, that's pointing to Black Crab. Uh, you might see that down in the bottom left. Um, the repository for Black Crab. Examples and board support, again, that goes to the subdirectory, the HDL subdirectory, where we were doing the uh, tile example work. Uh, and then another link here, um, which initially I got very wrong, <laughs> luckily. Laurie checked it, picked it out, and uh, pointed out the error of my ways, and we fixed that. Uh, this now pins, uh, pins, it points to the EOSIS um, OSS CAD script uh, and Laurie and I were poking around with that yesterday. This is so much better than before. Um, for those of you that have been here before, um, we used to jump through some fairly um, fairly fiery hoops in order to get everything worse working um, you know ice storm next PNR Yosis um, Verilator or I, I Verilog um, and then a whole bunch of other things on top of that TFU util etc etc so now the whole caboodle uh, can be installed directly by um, literally downloading the Yosis OSS CAD suite the open source suite uh, and it includes Verilator, iVerilog, uh, DFU Utils, it has the, I think the iStudio tool for programming, it has the tiny FPGA stuff, I know it's not relevant for us, but it's there. Um, it has all the library stuff for the uh, USB libraries. It also has things like the uh, FTDI stuff. Um, we don't use that with ours, but it has all the bits and pieces you need. It also installs Amaranth, which is fantastic. And I've worked out whereabouts it puts all of that. And I think we can work with that. Um, and I was talking to Laurie about this yesterday. Uh, the way that the development is set up for it at the moment, rather than me updating the boards uh, repo at this point in time, and I don't really want to do that until I'm sure about um, finalizing the ice logic board uh, board file um, what you can do is you can use a relative um, uh, import in Python which is what I'm doing right now which means you can have the board file along with your source files which and it is it sits in a HDL so you can actually use it in there without having to mess with the uh, um, you know with the Amaranth board repository updating etc um, so yeah it's pretty much got everything and next PNR and all that other stuff and all the stuff that's coming down as well so um, that's really nice and I think it's available multi-platform um, I haven't gone with a fresh install of this to know how easy or difficult it is on different platforms. It's something we're going to have to do. It's difficult when you've already got half the stuff installed. But um, that's going to make life an awful lot easier for a lot of people. Um, further information, so there's a link to the tiles repository if you want to know the tile specification, which is obviously open source as well. The documentation links to the docs directory and we're going to look at that in a second and then um, uh, there's a link to the uh, discord um, 
<laughs> I've just noticed I post. Hi, I post. Um, <laughs> I post is on Discord. <laughs> He's just said, curious. Did you ever consider using an i40 as a replacement for the FTDI chip? He says it looks like a bat. He's presumably referring to the uh, PCB CAD diagram. Uh, let me know if that's not what you mean. Oh, maybe you're looking at the actual picture. Which one do you think looks like a bat? The actual image. What, the unpacked one? The unbundled or the bundled? <laughs> I can see what you mean. It is slightly bat-like. Maybe I should draw some bat-like features on it. Interesting idea graphically. Maybe that should be the nickname. Good one, I post. Let's call it the bat. It's a code name. Right. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the other thing we want to have a look at. So if we dig down into, oh, this is such an amazing segue. So let's go to the documentation. I'm going to go straight to the hardware page. Obviously, this is still under construction. You've been seeing this. This is in the lab notes. Um, we've been building this as we go. So uh, what I want to talk about and kind of go through today and get your feedback on. <laughs> Laurie just said it goes like a bat out of hell. Oh, yeah. Very good. Very tropical. We lost um, meatloaf, didn't we? Was it this week or last week? That was a shame. So, uh, hardware. Yeah, last week. Um, let me just read through this because this is... Um, there's a bunch of stuff in here worth unpacking and I'm trying to find ways of describing things. It's really important for the crowd, the source campaign. If we go that route, which I'm on the verge of. So let me, let me just read through this because it will jog my memory because I wrote this yesterday. Uh, the IceLogic deck ILD hardware consists of modular tiles fitted to the main carrier board as required for a given development project. In other words, you customise which tiles you put on, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, on board the main ILD carrier board are the microcontroller, the FPGA, and some SPI flash and connectors. Simple. Uh, the ILD has two USB connectors. The first USB-C configured as a USB CDC serial device. This can allow programming of the microcontroller FPGA and flash, uh, along with UART and monitoring features depending on the required mode. And this is where we're going to get into it. Um, there is a second USB C, uh, which is USB PD, naming here, connector which operates at high power over USB delivery system operating from 5 to 20 volts in order to be able to power. A large range of modular tiles from simple LED drivers through to small, mo small motor and powertrain devices. An auxiliary power supply scheme is also provided for the more extreme power delivery requirements across the tiles. So by default we can use power delivery. If we need more power than that, then we will we use the auxiliary uh, inputs where we input it from an external supply. Right, important one here, mode selection. Okay, um, this doesn't look as good as the one I've got actually because I've probably made some corrections and there's some small headers as well. Um, let me just push that whilst I remember. I just want to avoid pushing that one. We just rebuild it all up.
sometimes takes a few minutes before this um, before it shows up. The modes one is what we need to focus on. Uh, I've just knocked that again today. There we go. Takes like a minute or two. Um, so yeah, operating modes. Mode selection is achieved via the mode button. If depressed on power up, it switches the device into USB DFU mode, which enables the firmware to be updated from the PC host. Uh, normal startup places, wait a minute, I'll tell you what I've missed from there. Straight off, the fact that the update is over USB. So let me just correct that. Updated from the PC host over USB. First change, good. Catching my own errors. So, uh, DFU mode, which enables the firmware to be updated from the PC host over USB. Normal startup places the device into development mode. In development mode, the device intelligently listens to USB traffic for a new DEC application. I'll come back to that in a minute. Or, comma, FPGA updates whilst concurrently relaying monitor, logging, and error information. So this is kind of the default mode, very similar to what we had on Black Ice um, MX, sorry, or Ice Core, to be specific. It's the same sort of behavior, not really very different in default mode. So it's looking for that signature um, that it recognizes from the um, FPGA image. Um, there may even be code that's being uploaded along with the FPGA image, um, but when that's uploaded, we need to make sure that the FPGA image part of that is at the front and then the code for the application binary um, is follows that. We'll probably have to concatenate the two together or something but anyway we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but that's the normal mode and it doesn't do anything else other than it enables us to get logging information back and error information back over the USB. So if you if you cat um, the USB, you know, forward slash dev forward slash ACM TTY zero, you will see all of that information coming back. Okay, so that's that's the primary mode. There's nothing magic in that. That works exactly as it did with Ice Core. And it's also good for backward compatibility because that means we don't have to change um, stuff that people are already doing, applications that already work, etc. Um, a third advanced mode can be entered pressing the mode button during normal operation. So even though it starts up in development mode, if you press the button once, um, it goes into advanced mode. This mode enables additional subcommand modes, including terminal test and flash for making things permanent or adding ROM data etc. One can switch back to development mode simply by pressing the mode button once more. Uh, so again this is similar to the way that Ice Core and Black Ice MX worked. Um, and we'll come back to this in a minute but just so we know when we're doing this um, we get some status and feedback uh, from the RGB LED. So let me just explain that. Then what we do is if we come back round, and in particular I want to talk about the advanced mode. Um, there is an RGB LED on board which can provide feedback and status of the board's mode and operation. In normal mode, this is unlit. Uh, yeah, I'll come back to that in a sec, Laurie. Um, sorry. So um, the RGB, by default, when you come up in development mode, is unlit. 
There is another LED on the board which illuminates to show that there's power, but that's separate. Okay. If the application or the FPGI image is uploaded, it will change to red and it will extinguish on successful completion. So that's very similar to what happened before on the ice core and black ice MX. So, so again, I'm keeping that backward compatibility in that sense. So when you program it, the LED will go red um, and then that red light will extinguish, it will go out if it's successful. If there's a failure, like a bad image or something that's been sent to it, or there's some sort of problem with the hardware or something like that, then the red light will stay on, the red LED will stay on, and you know there's an error. So again, that's very similar in many ways to how ice core and black ice worked. If the mode changes, it will illuminate green. So now rather than the LED being unlit, you will see the LED is green. So you know you're in advanced mode rather than regular mode. And it will change to amber during programming and back to green afterwards. Again, if it stays amber, you're in trouble. It's probably a bad image or a hardware problem because the programming, the FPGA didn't work out. It will likely be, uh, sorry, a third state is possible when the FPGA synthesis drives the blue part of the LED, for example, in a blinky test. Uh, the color will blink between either blue and off when we're in development mode or blue and the mode color, which is probably going to be blue and turquoise if you're in advanced mode. So you can still do a blinky and still see something. Okay. Let's then come back to this uh, to these modes uh, and let's first answer Laurie's question as well. Um, oh, wait a minute! I posted one first. Is the mode feature the same as Black Ice MX? Well, it's 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 similar. It's kind of backward compatible, um, but there are some enhancements which we're going to talk about. Um, I haven't used any modes as of yet. Okay, cool. Um, so on the Black Ice, basically Black Ice MX, you're either in development mode, and that's pretty much the same as it is now, or if you press the button, when you program it, the FPGA image goes into flash and remains in flash. Okay, that's the only difference on the MX. It's the only difference between the green and the yellow mode, if you like. Um, Laurie asks, you don't mention UART to FPGA in development mode. That's correct, I don't. So what happens in in uh, development mode is it outputs errors and any logging information on the USB by default. Now, if you've written something that has a UART that is connected to the UART pins between the STM32 and the ICE40 FPGA, it will also output anything it's sending. Okay. What it won't do very well, at least, is receive any stuff. So if you want it in terminal mode, what you probably want to do is look at one of the more advanced modes. So if you just want stuff coming back from the F FPGA, you can just use it in development mode. Okay. Um, I mean, you can send stuff to it. It could work. But the problem that you can get into, um, because it's doing the magic looking for the FPGA, the ICE-40 signature, is if you were to send something to the FPGA that happened to contain that signature, which is very slim, unless maybe you were getting the FPGA to up, 
update its ROM or flash. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, then it could be tripped up by that. Um, so although it will work like a bi-directional terminal, there is some gotchas in there. So I think we might need a purer mode where that's not the case. And that is the point of having this advanced set of advanced modes. I can see Laurie's uh, typing. So he's going to probably respond to this in a minute and we can see, um, see what he thinks of that. Um, when we go into advanced mode, it's not acting magically anymore. It's not doing this kind of um, looking for the signature. In advanced mode, it's going to be looking for a set of commands. Um, you mentioned allowing data appended to the bitstream. How would you determine the size of that? I don't know yet. In development mode, I don't know yet. Let's talk about advanced mode. We'll come back around to that. So in advanced mode, um, it doesn't just look for the signature. You have to give it commands. Um, so it's a bit more sophisticated. So we could, for example, have writing to flash modes where we could specify, um, you know, we want what's going to follow sent to this address and it's this many bytes. Um, I don't know, could we use, possibly use, um, could we reuse tiny FPGA's code for that, do you think, Laurie? Just see if I can find that. Hold on. Bear with me. Because this can be really useful. Anything that we could reuse might be um, might save us a great deal of um, work. Uh, FPGA. Modes. Tiny FPGA BX guys, programmer to upload code using the programmer. Um, Laurie says no, the tiny FPGA code is not helpful, as that just relay SPI flash commands. Oh, so you don't think that's the best way of doing it? Um, sorry. Was the one that we found before that we thought would be a good way of doing it? Can you start with the... DFU mode is better. As you can define zones. Okay, um, that means that the advanced mode 
is DFU mode though, because we physically have to bring the USB up in DFU mode. That's not a problem. It's just once you bring it up in DFU mode, you definitely can't have these sub modes such as um, terminal that I mentioned here. So it's not a problem. We can go down that route, Laurie. Just keep it plain and simple. Um, DFU mode. Uh, yeah, we could have a terminal mode. Um, in terminal mode, um, we've probably flashed a green LED to differentiate it. Well, um, I could be clever. Here's how I could be clever. Just flashing the green LED might not be a good idea because it's a bit confusing. Um, into what if if you know the blue LED I'm reserving for being able to flash. To do blinky well if i incidentally made that the uh, fpga tx pin from the fpga's point of view when there's traffic going over that it would flash so rather than just seeing green you would see uh green turquoise as it's flashing so there would be some visual feedback in terminal mode, but only, only when it's um, physically sending something. Hold on, wait just one moment. I've just had a thought. Bear with me a sec. Uh, let me just look something up. Yeah, the blue's only going to change if there is traffic being transmitted. Otherwise, the blue LED is going to be off. Um, that's a shame. If it was the other way round, it would be more obvious. Um, because I'm just thinking the TX line is going to be high. The only time it's not high is when it's sending, you know, a start bit and then any zeros in the byte that it's transferring and then it returns back to normal um, high status i.e. it's high by default isn't it you see if it was low by default by default the blue led would be on when it's in new arc mode because these are active low 
the only other possibility is inverting it but that would mean adding a, a FET then as soon as you put it into UART mode on the FPGA it will take the pin high that in turn will pull the LED low if there was a an inverter like a FET or something so I mean it's possible it's just I want to be able to differentiate between the modes so that you know what mode you're in because you're otherwise you're going to be thinking is this working um, did I press the button once or twice or three times whereas you know uh, at least with this assuming that you've loaded the synthesis into the FPGA that pin the TX pin should be high even if it's not sending anything if it's just ready to send that in turn could be inverted which then drives you know the uh, the blue LED so you get some visual feedback But I do think it's nice having a terminal mode that is just dedicated to being terminal that can't be interfered with in terms of, you know, um, magic signature detection for images and stuff. I mean, basically, you know, terminal mode is development mode with magic signatures turned off. No magic mode. Um, this could be a little confusing as we would have two DFU modes, STM flash and FPGA flash. And two... Uh, CDC ACM modes, development mode and terminal. Yeah, although um, the actual uh, STM flash DFU mode. Um, on boot up wouldn't necessarily be used much unless you know what you're doing so our DFU mode could for example do the same thing that the boot one does but without having to boot or go through the hold, you know, power up, off, hold the button, power on. In other words, the DFU could do similar to what the current uh, boot DFU does. But it can write not just to the internal flash, but to the external flash as well. So we'd include both. That could just be, a, you know, a, a memory or zone mapping or however you want to do it. Um, then, you know, then we wouldn't really be pushing the use of the boot DFU mode because the only time you'd ever need that um, would be if you broke it somehow. Does that make sense? If you somehow managed to uh, brick it and you didn't have a debugger, then you might need to use the um, um, the boot DFU.
mode. The, uh, you know, the unspoken mode. Then you've just got your free modes. Well, in fact, you've actually, I'll tell you what, why don't you just have two modes? Okay. So you've got development mode and you've got DFU mode. Um, terminal, so development mode could have some way of turning off on and off the signature for example so maybe one press on the mode button would toggle the magic and a long press on the button would switch to advanced DFU uh, switch to DFU mode what about something like that Oh, tea's gone. Onto the cold refreshment. I've got my big uh, vacuum mug full of cold water now. Mm. It does keep it cold nicely. <clears throat> Remind me in a bit, um, my post or Laurie, to talk about um, hardware changes with a flash that I'm thinking about. Um, so Laurie is saying, um, yes, you could have zones for the STM flash and FPGA flash. I quite like this. Uh, yes, that might be good as it means the host uh, would not see the change of endpoint when still in uh, CDC ACM mode. That's right. Because we're just switching the magic on and off. Uh, I post says it seems reasonable. However, I haven't used any of the modes yet. Well, it, they're very simple on the Black Ice MX. Um, this is more sophisticated, but we're trying to keep things easy to understand, or at least if there is an option there that is more difficult to understand, um, that's not normal operation. That's kind of rescue operation or something. Um, but yeah, we need what we need. Um, OK, so I mean, this pans out quite well then. So we've got the normal mode and we've got the DFU mode. We've got in the normal mode, we have uh, just programming with the magic turned on and we can turn the magic off. We probably need to indicate that it's been turned off. Um, I wonder The STM32. Could. Pull that pin down. 
to this is going to interfere with um, transmission okay forget that one for the moment Let, so let's just think about the programming when we're in DFU mode programming what's in the STM flash and what's in the external flash is easy so that means if we're writing if we're writing an application that is a combination of, uh, of say a rust binary and a uh, FPGA synthesis binary then when we're in DFU mode we have all the controls we need to write each to the right place um, in memory Okay. I think there is a DFU thing for cargo. Uh, I'll let me come back to cargo in a minute. What's what's IPO saying? Seems reasonable. However, I haven't used any modes yet. What about a dip switch for input control choice? Uh, well, if you look at the board, I mean it's the same on them. Um, on the um, black ice MX and on the um, ice core but here there's the button that you press and it's just a push button it's momentary it's not a dip um, Let me just check something. Uh, stop that. Oh, you are being very naughty, Keycad. That's weird. Oh, you have to click on that. I'm just looking at something here. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you look at, uh, if you look down here where I'm pointing, We've got a little push button. That's not a very good place. If you've got the mezzanine board on, you can't get to that. In the new design, uh, there's a right angled switch next to the USB, so you can press it from from below, even if the mezzanine is um, is there. On the ice core board, there was three switches. It was the one nearest. To the USB connector it was the mode button it should say mode on it by the way I post yeah push buttons easier than dip switches generally for users um, yeah, sorry. On on the newer version, you can't see it on here, obviously, because it's a prototype. It's actually a right angled push button to actually sticks out from the board next to the USB, so it's easier. Uh, yes, you can, Laurie. Um, if you look, actually, if we go to uh, 
you look at the new um, picture, if you look down here, you've got the USB, then you've got an LED, probably USB, uh, next to the USB here, which will shine through and reflect off the uh, USB. That's why I like putting them next to USB. And then you've got the right angled push button next to it. Yeah. So the layout has changed just slightly on the uh, current version. It's been um, optimized. So you've got USB, LED, push button, i.e. mode button. Then you've got some crystals. Then you've got the programmer header with its offset holes so that you don't need to solder the header in you can just place it in and then you've got the other LED so the position of things have, have changed a little does that is it that should be better what do you think Laurie? clearer more clear So um, mode wise, uh, right. So what was I going to say? So if you're in a in if you like the advanced DFU mode, um, it's easy to not only update the FPGA image. But also you can update the um, firmware. Uh, it's also powerful in that sense and you, we'd have to be careful. Um, I think what we probably want to have is some sort of... Um, do we rely on the DFU or do we create a bootloader? That's the question. the uh, development mode in development mode we can update the FPGA easily because it looks for the signature and if we were updating the application as well um, we know the size of the FPGA image so we know when the application code um, when that that starts we don't know when it ends so we have that size problem if we were to allow application uploads like a bootloader um, I'm wondering even if that's a good idea. I mean, it would be possible because once you send the FPGA image, the magic has picked it up and it might always expect a um, an application update as well so 
So you could have something funky like the bite after the end of the FPGA because it knows how many bytes that should be. It needs to look at the last, the, the first bytes after that point because that is the, that will tell you how big the application upload is, for example. Because it knows where the end of the FPGA image is, once it gets to that point, um, it then takes the next however many bytes, big enough for it to hold the application. It reads those, so it then knows how many applications it's got to receive um, from for the application code. But then the other issue is it's much more complicated than that because so what does it do at this point? Because what it's been doing is why should you be sending the FPGA bytes? It's actually sending those over the SBI and it's programming the FPGA. So by the time it gets to the end of the FPGA image, um, it's effectively programmed the FPGA. But the FPGA isn't ready at this point because it then has to spin its wheels for a bit, effectively. Um, and it could be buffered. So at that point, it then needs to download, it then needs to read the next however many bytes, because it's waiting for that. Um, basically, it's waiting for, it's waiting for the done signal before it does the next steps. But whilst it's doing that, it could be taking the information for the new application that you want to run and we haven't even talked about that the new binary that we're going to run um, and that would have to be stored would it have to be stored or will it be run it needs to be put into the flash of the um, of the STM32 doesn't it and then we need to jump to the start of it effectively so we'd need a bootloader in that case a dynamic bootloader Yeah, I think in this case we're talking about code, Rust code that's been compiled that is loaded by the a, a dynamic bootloader in development mode. We're not talking about test data. I think in the case of test data, we're then in a complicated enough situation that we need to worry about the FPGA image in Flash, uh, the the code that's booted in internal flash plus any data that's in external flash you know beyond the um, the image the FPGA image No, I'm not talking about a Rust application running on an FPGA soft core. I'm talking about code that runs on the STM32.
Um, we need to cover the soft core as well, but for the soft core, I would be thinking about using the DFU mode because what would happen is the external the external flash um, would have partitions within it if you like boundaries so you'd have like the FPGA image you may have more than one FPGA image for example and then you have a storage area above that you know for any code and in that case because it's a soft core the soft core would need to then use SPI to access the uh, the external flash itself I wouldn't be trying to cater for the soft core type application um, in the regular development mode because it doesn't really um, I'm not sure it really makes sense doing that. I think you need something like the DFU mode to be able to do that because you're talking about, you know, complex partitioned areas of the flash that you need control over. Whereas in development mode, I'm just thinking about simple stuff. You know, you've got, you've got two things that you can write. You know, you've got the FPGA image or you've got the FPGA image and some code to run on the STM32. Well, the code for the FPA, PGA image, right, that gets written directly to the uh, FPGA, and then any binary stuff uh, that needs to run on the STM32 gets written effectively into, um, into Flash, STM Flash. but it doesn't get written into the whole of flash it gets written into a managed area of flash so you'd have some base code at the beginning of the flash that the stm32 boots that has all the stuff that operates usb and all that stuff so you wouldn't be able to overwrite that um, in development mode but you would be able to add to that and then what would happen is after that's loaded into flash uh, so the FPGA is initialized with its synthesis and its image and then the application binary is loaded into the you know upper area of the flash that isn't being used on top of the existing you know firmware the black crab stuff uh, and then basically it needs to jump to that somehow to be honest I haven't written a lot of bootloaders so I'm not quite sure how they work but it's it's kind of or do we always expect the binary to include all the black crab stuff Um, Laurie's asking, have you thought about how the Rust firmware would call or interact with the Rust application? Well, there's two things to that question. If you're in DFU mode, I think there may be something that you can plug into Cargo that's written in Rust that we could possibly extend that enables you to directly upload the DFU rather than having to use the DFU utils if you wanted to so that's one way but in development mode then you need to have some sort of resident bootloader um, and there would need to be some hooks uh, for the application to run We'd also have to have some restrictions there to prevent it messing with the firmware itself. Um, I 
or at least messing with the hardware that we're using. Um, I, and I, I'm struggling in my head to think, well, then does it include Black Crab, Black Crab as a library, you know, that has an automatic in it where it calls that before it calls the um, bits and bobs that you're running. Um, the other thing that you can't see so what I'm thinking is we're using RTIC at the moment right and that's fine initially but I don't expect the people that use this unless they really know what they're doing and have followed this development etc I'm not going to expect them to write their stuff and understand RTIC. Sure, some people are going to be able to do that, but it's going to be a relatively small number. The the um, step to Rust is difficult enough in itself without adding those complexities to it. So the way, the long term way that I want to do it. And I can't do it yet, but I probably will be able to, I'm hoping by the summer, is to use Rust async. So what I will do is I will port the uh, Rust firmware over to an async um, um, arrangement. And then using async, I will structure the code so that it's much easier for the user to come in and I will offer async hooks, basically, for things like uh, the QSPY events. Okay, so I will make all of that async so that when the user comes to write their code that talks to the uh, synthesized uh, FPGA image um, as the SPI events happening then what happens is they would write their code using the async hooks that we provide to make it simple so their um, their code wouldn't need to worry about any of the complexities of using internal peripherals and that kind of thing with the exception of maybe the ADCs um, but again, I can provide async uh, hooks for those as well. So there's basically a load of async hooks. So they don't have to worry too much about the low-level hardware. The async hooks give them access to ADC data and events, QSPY data and events, and then later... Um, on the on on some of the more advanced platforms they'll also have um, uh, things like video events as well but that that's a long way off uh, we don't even have the hardware for all of that yet um, but using async as the hooks because I think that's mentally much more much simpler for them so when they're writing the code, they don't have to worry about all this horrible low level, um, you know, peripheral stuff that we're having to deal with here. They're, they're kind of coming along um, much more high level rust, if you like, and just basically filling in async hooks to the various facilities. Um, and in terms of the um, async, I think probably we'll use uh, Embassy. ABI, what's the B stand for? Something application, something interface? Um, <laughs> async is slightly different, but binary interface right um, 
I think what it will be, I think actually what it will be is all of the black crab stuff will be hidden away behind the ASIC libraries, embassy libraries. And we will expose a bunch of async hooks that enable them to write the bits that they need to write in Rust, along with libraries that they can import to do things like get the analog values, etc. Yeah, more API than API. I would say. I think you're right, Laurie. But simplified, you know. I don't think it would be as simple as Arduino. I mean, all Arduino is, is, what is it, set up and loop. Uh, it's, it's, we're going to offer a bit more than that, obviously. But it's async. If, if you've looked at the um, async way of doing it, it's actually quite interesting. Um, the other good thing about going down the async route is we can also probably support Python as well later because Python has a good async um, set of libraries as well so you'd have a good you know async all the way through as far as codes concerned um, if you haven't seen async, what async basically does is it turns your application into basically an event driven application. Um, so you'll have a, you know, basically you'll have a function that's effectively called an async function that is called where you do something and then you yield um, because you're either waiting for something or you're going to wait for the next event um, but underneath what it does is it creates kind of um, co-routines um, in Rust these are spawns um, but async isn't just those uh, coroutines it's also you can use it to handle interrupts um, and hardware events as well and that's how we're hooking you know the QSPY stuff and all of that so the idea here is not to have them have to dig away into things like um, the embedded HAL, uh, let alone talk to USB or any of that. You know, they will be able to talk to a serial device, you know, if they want to output stuff. Um, they'll have libraries and things for doing that. There'll be libraries for dealing with, you know, exchanging data being able to send data over QSPY and there'll be events, async events that they have to respond to in order to respond to the peripherals um, that you're using QSPY. And then um, we might abstract some things like display stuff, possibly although really that should go over um, QSPY anyhow. Um, then the other things we will have later on is like a streaming API. Um, again, we'll wrap that with async, but it's for, it's for moving larger amounts of data for things like cameras and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> more pipeline like um, but yeah async is the way to go it's the only way to make it easy and intuitive for the user 
without bogging them down with things like the embedded hell and stuff because that's just suicide you know uh, this all sounds good to me but the rust side will need a lot of prototyping yeah well it has to be developed you know once I get the hardware out then we can you know get working on it the thing that's stopping me working on it now Laurie is the USB support isn't finished for Embassy yet they're working on it and then I'm going to have to do some work on top of that um, but most of the bits are underway but for the moment I'm using RTIC just to get the firmware working so at least it works certainly at the level that Black Ice MX works we can probably get the DFU stuff working as well if we can get all of that working we can then abstract some of that into API stuff um, and then what we'll have to do is we'll have to do the um, the uh, move over to async I mean it's not a huge hurry for that bit you know that's months down the road before we do that really yeah uh, focus right now is really on getting the hardware out there um, getting some to you guys and the early adopters and then later when we get it out to a larger number of people then you know the focus is more about how they can then develop on this you know in a fashion that's much much simpler and easier you know once we've done you know the trickier more complex stuff um so yeah i'm not sure about the development mode and how that will work moving forward um i may avoid doing anything too much on that front until we switch to an asic sorry not asic async firmware and at that point it then becomes more viable so kind of um, the base functionality will be the development mode will be very similar to the um, the ice core mode um, but it will have this sub terminal mode that's easy to do um, and then we also have this DFU mode uh, which can be used to do the more complex stuff for now and then later on we'll come back round to it uh, we'll we'll flip the stuff over to an async arrangement because by that time we will have run the experiments and worked out what we can and can't do uh, and then we'll introduce you know a kind of if you like a real-time uh, async mode so that we can dynamically change the application from within the development environment I mean if you're in the development environment already with a uh, debug probe you can do it anyhow but you have to know what you're doing right now with the black crab stuff which means not only do you have to understand rust but you also have to understand you know the um, the embedded how the f7 quirks of that embedded how uh, the synopsis OTG USB you have to understand the Pro RS at least to a certain level and then you have to understand all of the RTIC and the black crab features that sit on top of that in order to do anything um, I mean I will refactor that that will become easier but it's you know you've got several layers of onion there um, that have to be understood it's difficult to abstract that away simply at this point in time 
Um, I think we have to get to ASIC to make that simpler for people. But that's a switch over. Uh, how are we doing for time? Nine o'clock. Whew. Any questions? It's a good point for, for questions. Are you happy with that as a development plan, by the way, in terms of, you know, if you think of it in terms of milestones, but the milestone is to get, you know, application mode working, you know, we're some of the way there. On the basic Arctic, black crap stuff. Um, to add the terminal sub mode to that at some point um, and then add the DFU mode and then after that we look at adding the more dynamic async stuff yeah no point trying to chew on the async stuff yet it's like yeah, we can't anyhow because not all the uh, all all the peripheral supports there yet. By the time we get to that, it will be, or well, at least I hope so. Um, cool. Um, so we did some of the documentation stuff. So we've got that covered, which is good. What else? What else was I going to cover this evening? Oh, there was something about the flash. What was it about the flash I was going to talk about? In the scheme of things, I want the flash to be more owned by the STM32 than by the FPGA. Um... There is this, still this possibility. Here's what I'm thinking, right? And this is relevant to the stuff I did on, on Wednesday as well with the UARTs and the issues that we have between the, uh, you know, um, serial out and serial in switching. Um, one of the things that I was toying with is what if we don't allow the FPGA to boot from Flash? Um, historically, we've always allowed that uh, directly. So we've always said that the FPGA, if it so wished, could boot from the Flash itself. Sorry, when I say boot, it doesn't really boot. What it does is it loads, you know, whatever FPGA image uh, is in the flash now there are issues with that as I've discussed before the benefits of having that I think are now vanishingly small um, the reason for this is the only real time that was useful is so that the FPGA could come up standalone and then read whatever, you know, with a soft core in it and read whatever it needs from the flash. So if you turn this off, then potentially you've lost that, but that's not true. So another way of looking at this is what we say is the STM32 always programs the ICE40. It never programs itself from Flash. And in this case, what the STM32 does when you power up is it takes the FPGA image from Flash, external Flash, and it writes it to the ICE40. Okay. 
The I-40 can then, if it so wishes, access the flash in order to get to its program in the case that it's running the soft core. Uh, we're not stopping it doing that. Now, oh, I should also mention at this point that we have the mezzanine option as well, whereby we will have hyperflash. Hyper and what you probably want if you've got hyperflash is you wouldn't want to use that SPI flash at all. You probably want your soft core to read from the hyperflash because it's going to be considerably faster than the SPI flash. It's going to be, you know, a, multi, a, a, a magnitude faster, in fact, because it's wider and faster and it's DDR, not SDR. Um, so it will literally be a magnitude faster to read it from that flash. So I can't at this point see a justification for the ICE 40 in this case loading itself from the flash. And I'm thinking about disabling that. Why would I want to do that? Well, the reason I want to do that is I can then wire it so we're always using hardware to program the ICE 40 and we're always using hardware to program the flash. And we don't have to bit back. That's the win. That's the benefit of taking away the ability of the um, ICE 40 being able to load itself from flash. So in other words, I'm saying we move to an entirely managed scenario where the STM32 is exclusively responsible for whatever the image is in the FPGA. Feedback. I'm sure Laurie's got something to say about this. He'll probably catch me out and say, "Ah, oh, you haven't thought about this situation." No, execute in place should be fine. It doesn't change that. Laurie says, it sounds feasible. I like this. Here's what I'm thinking. Right. And there are some advantages. At the moment, what we have on the, on the routing of this board is we have a QSBI, a quad SBI link to the FPGA on its own set of pins. And then we have an SPI link to the ICE 40, which also goes to the flash. What I'm proposing is we disconnect the ICE 40 from the um, from that SPI link, and then we use the quad SPI to connect to the ICE 40 in such a way that if we use it in SPI mode, it programs the ICE 40. Okay. Also, the flash is wired in, SP, in quad SPI mode, so we should be able to write to it in quad SPI mode, and the FPGA can write to it in SPI mode, but it can't boot from it because the serial in and out are flipped in the STM32's favour. But if you wrote a soft core, that wouldn't matter 
because you just program it using the other pins. The only times where it's hardwired in terms of SPI in and out is on the boot up. Sorry, on the startup of the ICE 40 when it's booting when it's loading from Flash itself. Um, one thing that Laurie says is you lose the ICE 40 multi boot features, uh, but they're not much, they're not used much apart from on the boards that need need it, like Tiny, FPGA BX, FOMU, uh, and Bitsy, and probably Icebreaker as well. No, Bitsy, I think, not Icebreaker. So, yes, in our case, we don't need it because we've got the STM there that can do the management of the different FPGA, uh, uh, sorry, do the management of the FPGA it synthesized images. So we're never in a position there where we can't, you know, where we can brick it effectively because the STM saves our butt just in the same way as the FTDI might do if you were using one of those. The other magic that this gives me is it frees up another four SP uh, four um, ice forty pins which I can use. I have another cunning plan. Um. But I need your feedback, guys. I need you to think of all the things I haven't thought of. I need you to tell me why I shouldn't do this, because otherwise I probably am going to do it on the next revision. I mean, one thing that it would mean is that you couldn't use QSPY in the FPGA at the same time as loading code for your soft core because it will be on the same bus although you could have some logic inside that you know enabled you to do that safely i guess um but again in that case what i'm saying is if you're running a soft core don't use the spi flash use the damn hyper flash going to be better and faster anyhow and you the pins are there for it so um, there is a problem on the STM32 side as well uh, it's not really a problem uh, there is a performance issue because the same pins are shared for programming the SPI as reading the flash, if I was going to program in non-development mode, in other words, the image isn't coming from the USB, um, I, I'm reading the image from the flash, I'd have to read a chunk from flash, put it into memory, and then write it to the ICE 40, because I couldn't do that concurrently at the same time because pins are shared between those two devices. On the upside, I might be able to read it at much higher speed if I was using Quad SPI. Um, Laurie says, do you have enough RAM in the STM32 to read the whole bitstream into memory? The answer to that is no. I think there's... Ooh, no, 
I may have. I mean, it depends how much what you're running. Um, is taking how much you're using for your USB buffers and stuff like that uh, I can't remember off the top of my head hold on let me just double check bear with me a sec we can check remind ourselves how much we've got uh, where did I have this was it here there no I had this data sheet open. I didn't move it over to here, did I? No. I'm pretty sure I had it open here. There. Um. We have uh, 256 kilobytes. We have a quarter of a kilobyte of memory plus a few extra bits, but ignore the extra bits. Um, so yes, we could read the entire image into, um, into memory. It's, I think, it's about 130k from memory. You know, for an 8k HX image. Um, so if we were using half of the memory, we'd still have enough left. Um, yeah, you know, you'd have to you'd have to know how much you were using memory wise but I mean even if you couldn't fit the whole thing in you could do it in you know four chunks or two chunks or something you know or chunks of 64 or something it's not difficult but yeah assuming you are economical with your memory you could read the whole caboodle and still have some change left over I wouldn't doubt so if you're in DFU mode or boot mode then probably yes so if you're booting from that which is probably you'd either be in boot mode when you were doing this in which case it wouldn't be a problem because you may allocate some of that uh, memory afterwards or the only other time you'd be changing this is when you're in DFU mode right but effectively when you go into DFU mode you are restarting because you're changing the USB configuration so it's like restarting so you'd be resetting all the buffers and everything else so but you'd only do that when you're changing the DFU mode if you were staying in DFU mode and uploading multiple images and stuff uh, then you might have um, more um, issues to deal with but if that wasn't really development mode and that was only you know for more permanent setting up of things and tests then that's like you know you could structure that in such a way that I don't think that's going to be a problem I mean there's plenty of memory is what I'm saying I don't think you're going to get tripped up on that it's not like we're running big libraries in the firmware you know we've not got like TCP IP and stuff um, when it comes to user apps that may change because we probably want to be using that reserved memory for the async apps if you like but maybe that wouldn't be the case if you're in um, 
DFU mode or something. I think what effectively I'm saying is if you're if you're in DFU mode, uh, it needs to hold on to a larger chunk of memory. But even if that gets compromised, it could read it in chunks, you know, four chunks or two chunks or something. There are all sorts of compromises that could be made. I need some sugar, I think. Excuse me, munching. Laurie says, uh, I currently can't see any drawback in disabling the ICE 40 master SPI mode, but I will have a think about it. Yeah, likewise. soon right just give me a sec folks just got to go and fill this up and we'll be back um back with more refreshment not as cold 
to run it longer. Uh, let me just check messages. Uh, we effectively had that on Black Ice 2 as that had the Ice 40 flash. So things like uh, Hogler's retro stuff, read bit streams for the STM32 flash and program the Ice 40 from it. Yeah. That's good. So we are all in agreement, but obviously we need to think about this. Um, and the good thing is it um, buys me some flexibility. And I might be able to do something special, but I'm not it's something I thought about today. Uh, it's actually something I've been thinking about for a while, but I didn't think I'd be able to do with this board. Um, certainly something I wanted to do with the ECP version later. But we might be able to do it with this board as well. That will enable us to deal with um, some uh, higher throughput communications between the two devices are heterogeneous solution. Um, but I, I may talk about that next week. Because there's a few things I have to work out. We're very, very close to being able to do it if I can make these other changes. But I need to verify that to see that it does actually make sense to do. But it will affect the hardware slightly. It means slightly more hardware changes than I was originally planning. Um, but we can possibly afford those now because we're not working to the Chinese New Year deadline. We've bought ourselves some time effectively on the uh, hardware front by doing that. Any other general stuff that you want to deal with today? Because I'm, pro I'm probably not going to go and start doing um, uh, any of the uh, black crab stuff at this point I mean I could do a bit of the documentation maybe but um, I'm not going to start programming at this point it's just not uh, it's just not enough time to fit that in because I'm not going to stream really late today um, are there any things that you want to discuss, guys and girls? Anything that I haven't covered, things that you've been thinking about, things I need to cover, anything on the documentation. I'm having real fun with the um, descriptions. I've got to think of a way of describing what this is. Now, when you're in our position, you've been, you, you, you folks have been following me along on this this journey, and that gives you insight to it. But if somebody's coming to this cold, you know, and they're going to look at this, how do we explain what this is? So we've got the the modular tile part of it right now the clever the clever part of that will be you know when we do the async stuff as well is when you put your module in you will have code that can support that module um, async code effectively that responds to events to do with that module Right. So a lot of the work can be done 
to make it easier to get people going on these things. So in some ways it's a bit like a rapid development system. But there is one of the things about this is it's a what's known as a, a heterogeneous uh, embedded system. And the heterogeneous, the heterogeneous uh, elements to it, really, the mixed parts, the different mixed parts are the FPGA and the microcontroller operating together. And in some cases, there's an orchestration layer that sits above that. But that's where the heterogeneity is in the combination of these two things um, that is going to be a challenge uh, to present to people you know how do we find a simple way of describing it and underneath there's some important points to the story right if i was to try and do right what what is this good for okay so here's some examples you know from in my experience things i've had to deal with you know designing embedded electronics and doing the firmware and all of that kind of thing particularly for things like robotic stuff i mean some of the things in robotics are very common to other areas okay but what the hardest part um, if you're just trying to use microcontrollers, for example, to solve problems, is um, on one hand, you want to make your code nicely abstracted, understandable, easy to get bring other people in to use, to pass on to other people, and well maintained and supported. And it also means having quite a nice model of how things work right software and that's fine right up until the bo point that you have to deal with what's known as the real-time constraints now real-time constraints basically come along and just give your abstract modules a good kicking for want of a better term because the only way you can meet your real-time constraints, and I'm talking about having more than one real-time constraint here, that's quite important. You know, in any real-world scenario, you will have a whole number of real-time constraints. So if you're trying to do that on a microcontroller, the only way you can meet your real-time constraints is by using interrupts. Now, if you've got a single interrupt, you can and you make it short you can make it fairly short and fairly predictable in the way that it behaves you can be quite sure about how it's going to operate with relatively small amount of testing okay so you can say uh, this interrupt will interrupt my code within this number of microseconds because i know what my code's doing and, and I know the worst places in that code where this interrupt, interrupt can occur and how long it takes for that interrupt to be serviced in order to meet the real-time goals of the system, right? Now, where that gets difficult is if you've got more than one interrupt. So if you've got more than one interrupt, then you have to deal with um things like preemption and interrupts interrupting other interrupts because i can no longer know when the the short the, the worst case scenario is with this interrupt and my code that's running um because i could already be servicing another interrupt for another peripheral or another real time constraint when this interrupt comes along that I'm trying to respond in time to. And the more of those you get, the more of the interrupts that you get that have to preempt or sit on top of your other interrupt, or you have to start dealing with, you know, your 
priorities of which interrupt you know should take charge at any specific time so then you have much more of a complex suit of how the attention the cycles of your microcontroller running the code are going to service and deliver within the real time constraints in fact you it very quickly gets out of hand and you don't meet the constraints but you don't know that you won't meet the constraints because trying to test the combinations of interrupts on interrupts is very difficult and it starts mangling the state of your code as well because you're having to share state with the code and you're having your state interrupted by other interruptions of state to service other real-time constraints so you you end up with I would say spaghetti code, but basically you start taking apart your nice abstractions um, in order to try and meet constraints. It's it's nightmarish if you've ever done it. You can do it. It takes lots of skill, lots of practice and lots of experience, particularly with, you know, the microcontrollers you're using at the time. Um, With uh, when I used XMOS to do robotic stuff, this was less of an issue because they didn't have they did have interrupts, but you didn't use interrupts. What you had was you had an event mechanism, and you had a you know, concurrent sequential programming paradigm based around those events, so that you you wouldn't get yourself into the same sort of trouble. You could actually structure your code in a way where you didn't fall into these horrible horrible messes so you could actually structure the code nicely and keep to the real time constraints but that's not true with my, most microcontrollers and most programming languages you certainly can't do it in C uh, in order to do it on the X core for example you had to use a concurrent language which was an extension of C called XC which was based on concurrent sequential pro processing now by being able to combine a regular microcontroller with which you write your nice abstracted code in and take away the real-time control parts of that and shove that into the FPGA and have the FPGA do that means you have a great separation of concerns the FPGA happens to be really really good at dealing with real-time stuff because if you're doing one thing on the FPGA you can also be doing another one without interrupting the process that's already in the FPGA because it's not a sequential processing machine it is a parallel set of gates that can run concurrently as concurrently as you want it to within the resources within the FPGA so it's excellent for solving real-time problems assuming you have some basic skills and know how to do that i.e you can program an fpga with either verilog or in our case here what we want to push forward is using something like amaranth so the good thing about this solution is you have your separation of concerns you have the real-time parts that you do that you use amaranth, amaranth for um, which reside or synthesize and exist in the FPGA and then you have your structured programming parts that exist within the microcontroller and you have this asynchronous in this case uh, event system that enables the two to interact you know in an efficient manner and that is the benefit of this system so the question is how do you simplify that you know anyone that's been there right already knows this stuff but it's not obvious when you're coming to it new you know if you've just done something very simple on a microcontroller before that maybe didn't use any interrupts or only use like one interrupt then this isn't something you dealt with before. It's an unknown unknowns. And some of these things are definitely unknown unknowns.
Uh, Laurie says, I think we need some applications to show off the capability of the system. I agree there. Yeah, obviously. Uh, applications are likely to be robotics, motor control, or digital logic tools. Yes, I mean, they're obvious ones. But um, anything with real time constraints and anything with several real time constraints um, fall into this category. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, it can be illustrated quite simply. And the other thing you've got to remember is, and uh, many people forget this, is even if you're using a serial port, let's not even go to USB, even if you're using a serial port, often you will have written that in the embedded uh, solution to use interrupts. So the moment you in introduce your interrupt, you've already got more than one interrupt to deal with. Um, and you've already got that constraint. Um, I mean, sure, if it's just that, then it's quite easy because you just make sure your interrupt has a higher priority than it does and that it has a big enough buffer to be able to deal with, you know, whatever the longest service time your interrupt's gonna be. It's fairly easy to calculate. But, you know, if you're using USB, that is even harder um, because the USB is going to have interrupts as well. But in our case, if you're using interrupts, you know, for USB, for serial port, maybe you're using it for doing the DMAs, you know, the SPI transfers, you've already got a crap load of stuff going on uh, on the microcontroller that are going to mess with your real time constraints when you start adding them. Um, so you've already got an advantage. You've got the benefit of having all of those things not interfering with your real-time constraints when you're using the FPGA to do them. You're already getting that for free. Because sometimes people forget about the things that you do internally in the microcontroller as being some of those interrupts that are already there that are messing with your real-time constraints. Things like you know, serial ports, SPIs, DMAs, um, you know, USB. Uh, and certainly if you're doing anything on display, you know, uh, display stuff is notoriously difficult to deal with. You know, you try driving a display and service real-time interrupts, so you're out of luck. If you try and do it all on the microcontroller, it's not gonna work. You're not gonna meet your constraints. You, you will get tearing, you will get delays in your um, frame buffer outputs, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's going to start looking shit really quickly. So um, you don't have to go to robotics to start seeing the kind of problems that I'm talking about. Um, you know, you can have everyday stuff that uh, messes with you quite easily. But yeah, if you're just reading like a humidity sensor once every, you know, 20 seconds and that's all you're doing, right, you're not going to have these sort of problems. Um, if you're trying to output to a HDMI display and you're trying to, you know, operate a fast ADC and you're trying to, you know, transfer information to and fro over USB and you know and 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 if you want to do a camera or something then you're really in you know heavy territory already so um, you can get there quite quickly is what I'm saying without very heavy apps But it's, uh, it's, you know, it's about getting away 
of communicating that. I mean, the application examples are okay, but then people see that and they don't realize what's going on underneath and why you've needed to do that. So you still need to be able to tell that story. You still need the narration that explains it because it's still unknown unknowns unless you've done it and you've been there. Um, and we just need to find ways of telling that story, I guess. Um, always tricky. Oh, I lost my audio for a second there. We haven't had any frame drops again. So much better on Linux, this stuff. On the desktop Linux machine than it is on the laptop. Can't believe it. Most of those problems that we're having were down to the laptop, I think. Any questions on the um, heterogeneity thing? The real time concerns, that kind of stuff. I just remember the um, today when I was going through my stuff. I still haven't built this um, this one from the last batch of PCBs I've got. I need to sit down and do that at some point. This is the uh, one of the more interesting uh, tiles. See if we can get a good focus on this. There we go. It's the uh, motor tile because uh, we need to play around with this. Be some fun. Now that you mentioned robotics and stuff. So I've got to put that together. I've got enough to put together a, a um, um, I've got the um, a few of the motor chips, the drivers. I've also now got the right angled um, triple headers, which we were waiting for on there as well. So I've got everything I need. Oh, have I got the current sensor resistors? I can't remember. I might need to double check that. That might be a showstopper. I've got some very small ones that need to make slightly bigger than the ones that I had before. Higher value. Uh, I post was saying. Or agreeing with uh, Laurie, um, digital logic tools are good. Sounds like a challenge for sure. All sounds good though. Interesting. Yeah, docs or tutorials on creating tiles would be a bonus. I mean, the first ones I want to do is with the existing tiles, showing how to use them. And then there'll be a more advanced one for creating the tiles. You know, because you'd have to dig a bit deeper then and explain how the, um, 
how the uh, connectivity in the event system would work. Uh, one of the first applications I plan to do on the device is my mobile robot that I did with the Black Ice tool, but with a camera this time. Uh, I'm hoping the motor tile will work with that. Uh, yeah, the motor t that that tile I've got will work with that, no problem. Uh, it's actually probably a little bit overkill because it will drive quite chunky brushed motors. Uh, it can also drive um, a couple of steppers. Two st no, is it one step or two steppers? It's not a stepper board, but it can drive steppers in you know half step mode. It won't do micro stepping. Or well, yeah, it might be able to do micro stepping, but it's not designed for that. Uh, don't forget, I've got the Trinamic stepper uh, tile as well, um, which is still on the design board. I've just got to finish that off and get the PCBs made for that. I've got some of the chips already to go on that. Maybe I can get that done in the uh, the next PCB order. That's another area that we need to look at covering. Um, yeah, and I might be able to do some enhancements on the uh, camera stuff as well. So you don't have to do all of the work inside the FPGA. That would also need an ultrasonic or time of flight sensor. Yeah, the time of flights are probably better than ultrasonics. Ultrasonics are really susceptible to noise. Difficult to get working in real environments. Okay, in model environments, but real environments, they can be shockingly bad. Time of flights are much more reliable. Um, and they're, they're a lot lower cost now than they used to be as well, so. I wouldn't bother with LiDARs. LiDARs are, they're very good, but the sheer amount of data that comes off of them that you need to process puts a very heavy burden on the system. Um, probably overkill for this sort of situation. What you can probably get away with for a basic robot is just maybe a couple of uh, time of flight sensors you know, a combination of more than one. What you can actually do, I've seen people do like a semicircular, like an array of time of flight sensors, but you just have like five or something, one forward, two at 45 and two at 90, uh, or 180 of each other, but 90 off the center. Uh, IMU is always useful on it. And what you can do is you can com combine the information from the IMU. So the IMU comes in really useful for things like um, the motor. So if you're moving, um, sometimes, I, even if you were using motors with the encoder sensors on them, you know that something's moving, but you might not know that your wheels are spinning, for example, if it's stuck. I mean, you can sometimes tell by the speed, the sudden change in speed when it slips, but you can't always tell that. You may have some slight traction, but you might not get the movement you expect. So you can actually use the IMU to confirm that you're getting the movement you expect, or by combining the information from the IMU and the encoders and the power you're putting into the wheels, you can then calculate whether you're actually making any progress or whether you're, you know, jammed up against something, for example. Um, yeah, that's quite a sim, you know, there's some quite simple algorithms for um, combining, you know, things like, um, what do they call it? Uh, I've forgotten the word now. Where you estimate your position based on the encoder turns 
and then you ratify that information with information from the IMU and on longer distances from changes in perspective of objects and things from, from the camera. You combine all of the pieces of information um, in order to compensate and correct for any losses because obviously the encoder losses if you have things like wheel spins at any point um, your calculation of position based on just those is going to suck basically <laughs> um, so you can compensate for those losses and changes by combining information from the IMU and camera and combining different sources in order to um, you know better understand your real position um, damn, I can't remember what it's called I was looking at PID controllers on the FPGA for robot velocity using encoders. Uh, yeah, that'd be cool. Hi, you Western Long. Welcome. Um, LIDAR's pretty accurate with a reflector map, but you've got to do the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data that has to be processed. Uh, SLAM kind of drifts unless you use it with odometry. Yeah, you'd have to combine the two. What's the name of those filters where you combine these different sources? I've forgotten the name. Weston, you may you may remember that. Um, it's a something filter where you combine all the different Kalman filter. Thank you, Weston. So you can use Kalman filters to bring together all the different pieces of information to give you a better proximity uh, awareness and stuff. Just like you do with, you know, multiple sensors. Um, thank you. Which board? You mean the one we're we talking about here or do you have one of the uh, black ice ones or something? Black Ice MX. Cool. Um, I don't know if you've caught how much of this stream or, or others. Um, did j Just in case you didn't know, I better give you, let me give you the link. You might not be aware of this, but um, I do archive the previous streams uh, on YouTube as well. Um, I'm not sure if you are aware of that or not. Um, on the playlists for, for the board that we're working on now, just use the tiles playlist. And then you can go back through um, any of that stuff. Yeah, well, Laurie's here. You can say thank you directly to him. He's on Discord, but he's probably um, on this chat as well. 
do you have a discord link because it's good to join us down at discord because we tend to take the conversation down there as well in between streams let me give you a link hold on try this one see if this works for you western i don't know if you use um discord at all you might want to just try that and see if it takes you to the right place do you use discord western He does, or she does, I don't know. He, she, they. You'll have to let us know. Um, so do join us down at Discord as well. Um, Yay, you're there, I can see you. Welcome. sometimes <laughs> yeah but feel, feel free to plunge the uh, YouTube archives because Twitch doesn't keep my um, streams at the moment haven't been streaming very long and I haven't advertised the fact because I need to um, optimize my streaming some <laughs> It's only got quite optimised recently, to be quite honest. It was a bit of a disaster before. Uh, we used to have all sorts of problems. Um, but we're getting there. And I'm getting used to it and stuff. So I may make it public at some point, or a bit more public. As with the stuff that we're working on, you know, the Logic Deck stuff. Right, folks, well, um, I'm probably going to call it for the evening, evening my time. Probably afternoon for some of you guys, evening for Laurie and girls. Um, I'm going to, um, I've got to do some more bits on the hardware. I'm going to have a look at that possibility that I mentioned earlier. Think about it over the weekend. And if it's any good, I'll let you know when we um, either stream next Wednesday or, um, or if we do a Friday session, maybe cover it then. Uh, I think I'm kind of breaking this down that if I do the Wednesday one, that's normally the um, programming and hardware work on the ILD etc whereas the um, Friday one's a bit more loose and casual a lot more discussion probably I think that the way that I'm liable to um, to move things I think if everyone's okay with that <clears throat> so
So, um, right. If there are no more questions, say now or forever hold your peace, as they say. Um, I'm going to call it an evening and go and chill a little bit, I think. I may hang around on um, Discord a little bit longer. But um, otherwise, I will see you down on Discord or at the next stream, which is likely to be Wednesday next week. I'm pretty sure it's going to be. I'm pretty sure I'm okay for Wednesday next week. Um, anyhow, so thanks for joining, folks, and sharing. Appreciate your patience and your input and uh, I will see you soon. Ciao.